This morning, we continue in the Gospel of Mark, where we will explore the true um, depths that our lives have stumbling blocks in them. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, but he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block for one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Pray that my words only be spoken and your words only heard, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that was a cheerful gospel, wasn't it? So let's dive in and see what's going on there. It starts with the disciples pointing their fingers at somebody and saying, that guy's got a problem. Fix it, Jesus. Jesus wastes no time redirecting the disciples' attention, saying, don't worry so much about him. He's going to be okay. Worry about yourselves. It's the same principle. Jesus is going to apply the same principle that he'll teach directly elsewhere. And he says, don't worry about the speck in your brother or sister's eye, but worry about the massive log that's in your own eye. And so that principle that he states there, he's going to apply here when he redirects the disciples away from what somebody else is doing to what they're doing. And he wants them to consider the way that their lives, that their behavior, that their actions, that their character or lack thereof are creating obstacles for people to understand how deeply those people are loved, how deeply they are loved by God, how deeply they are loved by others, uh, how their behaviors are creating obstacles to people experiencing the fullness of life, the abundance of joy that Jesus died that people would know. And so uh, the, in these verses, Jesus will, in, in, in verses 42 to 47, which are tucked right in there, there's going to be a word that's going to repeated, be repeated over and over again. And in Greek, this word is the word scandalos, which is exactly what it sounds like in English. It's a word where we get uh, scandal from that word. But when we think of scandal, we think of, of moral outrage or we think of uh, moral failure. And scandalous was not, didn't necessarily carry those moral overtones or, or undertones. It was simply a description of reality. It was a, it was a description of, 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 a, of a literal obstacle that kept people from going where they wanted to go. And that's why it's translated stumbling block rather than scandal. It would be as if, and I would have loved to have really done this, got four or five strong people, gone out and find the biggest rock we could find, bring it in here and just have placed it right here. And then when people had to come to communion or when people wanted to come to communion, we would have to work in some way, shape, or form to get over this rock. That's the picture that Jesus wants to paint in here. It's not so much a moral question. It's just a literal description of reality that sometimes there are literal obstacles that keep people from going where they want to go. 
And so he wants us again to think about our lives, wants the disciples to think about, and by extension, wants us, wants you, wants me, to think about the ways that our lives, the things that we do or don't do, the behaviors, pattern traits, so on, so, uh, so on and so forth, the way that these become uh, vehicle, uh, 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 obstacles, <laughs> the way that these become obstacles to people experiencing love, knowing that they're fully and deeply loved, for people being secure, people knowing that they are secure in that love, for people finding again the joy that God desires all of us uh, to know. And then he's gonna make it even more graphic still. He's gonna make it even more particular still. And, and, the, and this is you language. I mean, so he's, he's talking directly to them. He's, the, the, the you is gonna be this word that is repeated over and over again. And, and, uh, and so he'll say, if your hand caused you to sin, cut that sucker off. Because it's better to enter into eternal life maimed than to enter into hell with the whole body. And again, what he's talking about here, this, if this was, if he was texting, this would be in bold and capitals, all right? This is, this is hyperbole, this is over the top language, because he wants to make a point. And, and so he goes on, if your eye caused you to sin, gouge that baby out. Very, very graphic. It's better to enter into eternal life with just one eye than to enter into hell with your body intact. And what, what's he saying here? He, he, what, he's, what he's talking about is not something that's going to happen way down the pike someday. He's, he's really talking about current reality. And he's saying that in all of our lives, there are things that are near and dear to us. They've been with us as long as we can remember. Things like an eye, things like a hand, things like a foot. We can't imagine life without them. We get, they're, they're part of our identity. And yet, and yet, and yet, some of these things simply do not work. They promote untold misery and unhappiness. They perpetuate generations of pain. And, and, and so Jesus says, disciples, you need to be prepared as painful as it might be, as much as it might seem like we can't live without those things, we need to be able to cut those things off, gouge those things out. What's, what, again, what, what she's talking about, he's talking about actually a structural approach to change. And some of you may be familiar with systems thinking. Uh, the book that defines systems thinking was written years and years ago, but remains still the standard, is Peter Senge's The Fifth Discipline. And the fifth discipline is structure, is systems thinking. And so you can change on a, on a behavioral level, but that's the shallowest level of all. And we'll say a word about that in a minute. You can change in, by reacting to events, but that's still reactive. Or you can change and the very structure of a person's life, and that's gonna be systemic change. And so when you, when you cut off a hand, you're literally changing the structure of who and what you are, and it will be impossible to function in the future like you've functioned in the past without your hand. Thomas Keating, a brilliant man, gave the DeWitt lectures at, at Harvard a few years ago. He says this verse here where Jesus is talking about cutting off hands, feet, gouging out eyes, he says he is showing that what Jesus wants in our life is not some superficial level of change, but he wants deep structural change. And the way that, that, uh, that Keating de describes it, he says, if at if, if one point in my life, I, my identity is, is centered around being able to drink everybody else under the table, and then I become a monk, and he did become a monk. He says, and now I center my identity on fasting everybody under the table. What has changed? Nothing, right? Nothing has changed. There needs to be a deeper level of change than simply a change in behavior, than just a change in, in our reaction to events. There's got to be a change at the very core of our lives. And in changing the structure of our lives, we change the structure of the systems of which we are a part, family systems, religious systems, national systems, and, and in effect, we change the world. And, this is, and so Jesus wants to focus people down in on the structure of their lives. And, and, and so I, I want us to think about, in the remainder of this time, uh, what stumbling blocks, what obstacles there might be in our life, both in keeping other people and keeping ourselves from, from knowing how fully and deeply loved we are, how fully and completely we dwell secure in God's love, and, uh, and, and how we can know in the very presence of God the deep and abiding joy that Jesus wants us to know 
no, no matter what. And, and I would say that one of, the, one of the greatest obstacles, one of the greatest stumbling blocks, one of the single things that keeps people from, that, that holds people back in life, that keeps people from knowing how deeply they're loved, uh, that keeps people from feeling secure at all, uh, that keeps people from knowing joy is the desire to be normal, is, is the desire to be normal. Now, that, that might seem like sort of a shallow statement, so let me, let, me, let me fill that out a little bit. As I said, we're all parts of systems. You're part of a family system. Every single one of us in here is part of a family system. There's no getting around that. We're part of a religious system by the fact that you're here today in some way, shape, or form, at some level, you're participating in a religious system. We're part of a national system. Again, whether we like it or not, we're part of a national system. In your workplace, you're part of a system. Your work operates as, as a system. And, and systems exist for no reason so much as, except to perpetuate themselves. I mean, that, that's sort of the fundamental purpose of a system is a system perpetuates itself. And the way it does that is by defining a very narrow range of behavior and calling that behavior normal. And then by getting everybody else to co-opt with that, keep the simple, keep the system going. So if we can, and if we all engage the same behaviors, we look around at everybody and say, they're all doing what I'm doing, uh, then we all want to do that same thing and we all become normal in the system. No matter how unhealthy, no matter how destructive, no matter how much pain it might cause, we're going to keep that system going. That system is going to feel like a part of who we are. It's going to feel like a hand. It's going to feel like an eye. It's going to feel like we cannot do without it. But as long as that definition of normal is present, and as long as we all kowtow to it, the misery that it perpetuates is going to continue to be present in the systems of which we're a part, our families, our churches, our nation, our world. And, and, and so I want you just to think about this for a second. And, and, and I, w I really want you to think about this, okay? Uh, this, I, I don't often call in favors, but I, I really want to call in a favor, okay? It was my 60th birthday on Friday, so it, it, if you would honor me in this one occasion by truly thinking about this. Again, if you write things down, this is something to write down. If you talk about things over dining room tables, this is something to talk about at the dining room table. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is worth thinking about. The systems of which we're a part, we, de we define normal as in terms of, by and large, material acquisition or the acquisition of things which are visible, demonstrable, which everybody can see. So, so, so the, the normal thing for me to do, and you've heard me say this before, when I started in life, Linda and I had nothing, all right? We, we just sat in an apartment, we sat on boxes, we ate on a box, we slept on the floor, I mean, we had nothing. And now we have so much stuff, we don't even have room for it. I mean, we just, we don't even have room for all this stuff. That's completely and totally normal. We'd never even get a second thought, because what everybody does, all right? And, 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 and then in our culture, that, that acquisition of that which is visible, um, fitness becomes another extension of that, because fitness is one of those ways that, that, that our culture is just bought into 100% and projects that out as, as a way of, of showing that we're growing in our life, okay? Now, here's what I want you to think about. Are you growing emotionally, right? I mean, there are a lot of people, myself very much sometimes included, who are still operating emotionally like a four-year-old. Because as long as I can drive a nice car, you don't care about my emotional state, right? The normal thing, I can drive a nice car, he's a success but I might still be functioning like a four-year-old in my family, in my church, in my country. And that's okay. It's completely normal and therefore completely acceptable as long as I have a nice car. Are you growing intellectually? All of us have problems in our life. You have problems in your life. I don't have to tell you that. I have problems in my life. And the way, and again, I don't have to tell you this either, the way you've approached problems in the past, the way I've approached problems in the, in the past, they don't work. That's why the problems are still there. And that's why they're always going to be there as long as we approach them in the, the way we always. So how are you learning real specifically? What are you reading? Who are you sitting under? Who's mentoring you? Who, who, what therapist are you seeing? How are you learning to approach the problems in your life in new ways? And you know what? As long as I can stand up in front of you and present myself as fit, which I present myself as pretty fit, right? Uh, I mean, people look at me all the time and comment on how fit I am. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. 
I only wish that was true. Uh, but, 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 but I might not be learning anything whatsoever about correcting problems that are hurting my family dearly about problems that are making me ineffective as a priest and causing ripples to go. And we just don't care about that as long as I can demonstrate on some way that everybody can see it and admire it, that I've got it together, that I'm, that I'm making some sort of improvement, right? Let's take a final one. And again, I, I would love it if you'd really think about this. If there is an, even an inclination that there is a God, right? And I'm just going to guess by the fact that you're here, you're betting at least to some level in the odds in some way, shape, or form that there is some kind of ultimate being out there. If there really is an ultimate being out there, could anything, I mean, really think about this, could anything be even remotely as important as knowing that being? Anything. And, And I don't see how anything could possibly be that. And so, I mean, do you? How do you know God differently now than you knew God a year ago? How do I know God differently? There are lots and lots of people who still think of God like they thought of God when they were four years old. Haven't grown a bit. But as long as I have a nice house, as long as my house is nicer than the one I started in, I started an apartment, now I live in a house, you're going to look at my life and think that's completely normal. He's got it going on. That's the kind of person I want to be. That's why that initial song was so devastating. Looked great on the outside. What a great guy on the outside, but dead on the inside. And do you know how many people that describes? I'm willing to bet that describes some of you sitting here today, and you know that. You know that. You know that better than anybody else. And and, and there is not, again, there is not a major religion in the world, not one, not one, for all their disagreements, for all their disagreements, there there are some things that they just absolutely disagree, they absolutely agree on, and one of the things every major religion in the world agrees on, Jesus, and this is part of what he teaches, you cannot expect to know God better and approach God casually. It's going to take the same kind of commitment, the same kind of intentionality that, that, that anything you want to do well is going to take. And so are you as committed to God as you are to the externals of your life? And how does that manifest itself? And and, and so again, what's normal, what's completely normal, the way the system is going to have all of this function is as long as we got a bigger house, as long as we have a nicer car, as long as I can take a fancy trip, as long as I can demonstrate I'm fit, as long as I can do all these things, we don't care about any of this stuff that's really important. How sick is that? I mean, really. I mean, really. And when we understand that way, do we begin to understand why it is that the world is such a mess? And why it's nobody else's problem except my own. Because I can be the source of a lot of hurt. I am something. But I can also present real well. As long as I can present real well, I just don't care much about what's going on here. Let me tell you a story about someone who bucked that trend, who bucked normal, and someone of whom I'm uh, very, very proud. Um, And it is actually an inspiration to me. This person uh, was very successful in the world, a young man, uh, and just like most successful people, without thinking about what success means, did exactly what we described, went the acquisition route. And so you start with a certain level of car and you move up to a nicer car and a faster car. You start with a certain level of house, move up to another level of house, start with a certain level of trip, camping and whatever, and then you go to Iceland, whatever it may be. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know that's, that's, and, so, and so he graduated to a spectacular car, all right? And I, and I mean, and I love to hear that car driving in the church parking lot. It's quiet as can be in, in, the, um, in the cockpit, but, uh, I, but to outside, man, did that thing have an awesome exhaust, uh, exhaust note. But, and I just loved to hear it drive in. I just knew it was just a, a great thing. And I loved to drive, riding it was fun. I, I never, I was offered to drive it, and this is another story for another time, but given my history with fast cars, I decided that maybe that wasn't the best idea, so I, um, that may have something to do with rolling somebody else's Porsche, but like I said, that's another story for another time. Uh, uh, and, and so, I mean, this is a car that is a 120 plus new. Uh, it's a car that has, in it, you know, just uh, the new ones have over 600. The last year model had just under 600 horsepower. Zero to 60 in under four seconds. I mean, zero to 60 in the three second range. Limited top speed of 155 miles per hour. And really doesn't even begin to come into its own until it gets over 100 miles an hour. 
I mean, below that. And, and, and so like driving it down the road, zero to 60 comes so fast that there's really no pleasure in it. If you put your foot on the gas pedal and you're there, in fact, you're not at 60, you're at 100. And there's no real aural joy of hearing the, the revs climb because it happens so fast. And you just got to put your foot on the brake right away. And the car doesn't really handle like that car can handle till you get it over 100 miles an hour. But as Sergeant Johnson's will tell you, that's not a good idea on public roads. <laughs> and so the only way to really enjoy that car is on the track. And some people do, and that's a great place for that car. But on every day, it's an exercise in waste. So here's where, the, but that's completely normal. We all look at that and we look at this guy and we look at that car and say, man, this guy's arrived. Look at him. And we're envious and we want to be him and we want to have that car someday and we want to do all that sort of stuff. But this guy takes a different track. And, and again, this takes so much courage. Most people will never, ever do this. All right? Because it's too painful. It's too hard. It's like cutting off a hand or gouging out an eye. So he looks at himself and says, you know what? This car is, is an exercise in waste. I don't even really enjoy, enjoy driving it because it can't be driven like it's meant to be driven. So why do I own it? Why do I own this car? Could it be that I am fundamentally insecure? And in some way, shape, or form, I need this car to bolster my own sense of security. Is it possible that in some way, shape, or form, I don't have a very strong sense of my own self-worth, and so I need this car to prove to other people that I'm worth something? They ask that question, what does this car say about me? That's not very pretty, is it? <clears throat> like, that's pretty painful. That's why most people will never have the courage to ask that question. That's why most people will never cut off their hand. That's why most people will never gouge out an eye. And that's why the systems are going to continue to run. This run. But he sold that car. He bought a car that cost about a third less. Can you imagine the resources that puts into play? Right? Ask, ask yourself a question. Just Again, just another question, just to, just to play with and just to, just to sort of tease all this out. We all want to be generous, right? Every poll that's ever done, generous is, is almost always number one, but it's, al but it's almost always in the top three. So here's everything I have, and I want to be generous. Let's, let's just make it real practical. We heard about South Carolina last week, how they're suffering. We can put some money directly to affect it. We want to be generous. And so I tear off this little bit and keep all this for me and give this to, and, and this just to think about, thought experiment. Give it to, uh, to, to Jim and it, well, have I just been generous? Don't answer that, but think about it. Have I just been generous? And I have all this here and I have all that there. And what happens for so many of us is that we is that in, in buying that new car, getting that new house, doing this finance, that lifestyle, is we have to rack up a ton of debt. And again, this isn't a moral statement. I want to be really clear about this. This is why it's clear to see stu is scandal off the stomach block is not moral. This isn't a moral statement. This is a descriptor of an obstacle. Of, of, it's a descriptor of reality, of an obstacle that will keep us. And so as long as I have all this debt, so last week comes, maybe I'm making $100,000, and, and what I can afford to put in there because I have so much debt is maybe $100, all right? Here's my 100, and this is, is this generous? But maybe my lifestyle and the debt that supports it makes it impossible for me to do any more. And for that to seem totally and completely normal. So here's the thing, and then we're done. Then we're done. Uh, one of the most helpful things I ever read uh, and I, I've read a ton, but this is one of the things that just stands out above everything. Uh, the, it was was the when I, the day that I read, and this probably isn't news to you, but this was news to me. This was an epiphany, and it was like it was just ah, oh, it helped me so much. It was the day I read that somebody said, "Nobody's we're all abnormal." And what was happening with me is I knew I didn't. But it, I was so ashamed of that because I figured everybody else did. And, and it caused me so much pain. And so I just hide and participate in normal so much more. Buy the new car. But it didn't really make me happy. 
everybody else is buying a new car and they look so happy, especially on fake book. And, 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 and so I thought something must be wrong with me. And so I just worked all the harder and buy an even nicer car. And the day that somebody said, we're all abnormal. What happens when we feel, when we feel like we're fundamentally different, it isolates us, it cuts us all off. We don't talk. And we don't realize that they were all in the same boat. We're all buying new cars. And because nobody's talking, nobody says the emperor has no clothes. And the system just perpetuates itself. Nobody's normal. Nobody talks. Nobody admits to each other. And life just ain't working. I know I look good on the outside. I'm in pretty darn good. Huh. I already be honest with you, I'm pretty dead in here in the ways. Of but we just don't say that. So this is an appeal. This is a cry. To listen to the wisdom of the words of Jesus. To be done with being normal to turn our backs on the systems that seem so normal, that seem like we can't live without them, that feel like eyes and hands and feet, but which perpetuate so much misery. To keep us from being who God created us to be, to keep our resources from being put into play, to just turn our backs on all of that. What that really looks like in a life, that's what we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come. And I hope that if you take God seriously, and I believe you do, that if you want to be committed to God, more committed than you are to everything else, and I think if you're going to be committed to God at all, kind of what it's got to be, you'll join us for this series. Amen. Amen. <laughs>